Welcome to The Real Money Show. My name is Jeremy Wiseman. I'm joined with Jerry Karaya. The phone number, one eight seven seven eight silver and the website, guildhallwealth.com. Thank you so much for joining us this week. We've got a lot to talk about. We've got a few articles that we're going to riff off of. One comes to us from Better Dwelling. And for listeners of, the, of our show, you know that we love this site. It's about real estate, in, specifically in Canada. And I think this article is going to give us a great segue into the metals market and just the economy in general. Uh, Jerry, you've brought one from Incrementum, which is a great uh, extensive article uh, talking about the difference between inflation in the 70s and inflation today, how that's going to reflect on the metals. And if we have time, we'll get into this article from Jeff Clark, which I think would tie into the, into the real estate one because the title is how gold and silver will someday make a vacation home very affordable. Great. In the meantime, let's uh, before we get started, let's talk a little bit about what we've seen in the markets recently, what we've seen over the course of the year, and give a bit of perspective. Because I think, uh, Jerry, when, when someone is new to the market, they're looking right now and they're seeing gold is down 9% on the year. Silver is down uh, just under 1% on the year. And even though it's, as we tape the show today, it's only March 12th, it feels like either nothing is happening in the market per se, or this, or the Wall Street bets Reddit was a bit of a bust. What's your reaction to someone who's looking at the current numbers and feeling a little deflated, let's say? Very short term, we uh, are seeing things play out very quickly. The uh, silver squeeze, the the you know the Wall Street bets, uh, that was just a, a month ago, a month and a half ago. And the, the hype has definitely um, cooled off. The hype, um, you know, tailored off and people were looking at other, other realms in the market. Um, but the the, the short-term 9% down on gold, we just have to remind ourselves what gold and silver did last year. We had a great year last year. Both metals were up close to 35%. Um, and to have a little slight retracement, this is, again, expanding a little bit beyond short-term. Let's look medium-term now, guys. Uh, we're having a little bit of a correction all to do with the the 10 year treasury yield and currencies which is that is medium term because this cannot continue very for much longer and that's also going to be a bit of a buying opportunity because um, i was listening to an interview with michael pento and i'm actually reading his book right now about the bomb bubble um, collapse and he talks about the fact that you know okay the 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 interest on the 10 years gone up that's good for the dollar they're also going to open up the economy very soon, which is also going to bring uh, goodness to the economy. And it's also, but then, but then at the end of that, towards the summer, you're going to get this cusp of, you know, Jerome Powell's going to come out and say, well, we might have to, we might have to start easing the monetary policy here and pulling back because things are so good. Um, and also, and we'll get into more of this, the idea that you can't just keep printing money without a consequence and the money doesn't mean that the value of the dollar is any good so people are going to wake up to the fact that the dollar get right back to the fact that the dollar is a dead currency and you're right back to where we should be which is gold rising mm -hmm. and uh, the dollar falling mm -hmm. and that's that's really we're just in this sort of momentary lapse of excitement about about the end of covid and mm -hmm. you know we'll talk about that throughout the show because it is we are at the one year anniversary basically and you know i you know but with that narrative of reopening the economy it's almost like that that the phrase that says you know buy the rumors sell the news they're hyping up this this anticipation of us getting back to quote unquote normal reopening and then we're going to have a booming economy so therefore we're going to have to taper and and the markets will go through a taper tantrum jobs were lost industries have been shuttered you can't just pick pick up pick up the economy and kickstart and get going right away it's not going to work like that so buy the rumor sell the news when it actually plays out as time pro progresses we'll see how, how we uh, actually fare this economy is not ready um, I mean as much as we want to reopen the damage has been done so I, I agree. I think that from an economic standpoint, you know, if you had a restaurant that closed, it's not like you're just going to wake up the next day and open a new restaurant and create new menus and all of all of that, get a new premises and all of these things. On on the other side, I think they will pump up the fact that there is going to be hiring. 
Mm -hmm. The economy is reopening, so there is going to be rehiring, and so that there will be a bit of a bump yeah. along, you know, a bump up, which is which is positive. But you're, what you're talking about is more like the long-term fundamental structure problems that's mm -hmm. been related. And then, of course, you get into the fact that the governments, and again, I think this this article from Better Dwelling that we're going to talk about later in the show really taps into that. The just the amount of government intervention and the distortions caused by that. It's definitely one of those things where. Where the cure is how's that go the cure is worse than the disease mm -hmm. and uh, I think that's that's probably uh, gonna be should be the tag of the show today in terms of what this is because that's what governments are doing or central banks I should say is they're trying to cure something but it's it's not healthy for us not at all and I think that uh, the disease is overall inflation and we're gonna get into that a little later in the show actually the, I think the predominantly the entire show is gonna be about the the uh, the the money printing of these uh, draconian central banks. Uh, we are in uncharted territory and we're going to do some comparisons between where we are today versus, uh, you know, going back a few a few decades back in the 70s. So it's a very exciting time. The number one eight seven seven eight silver and the website guildhallwealth.com. Everything we do at Guildhall is deals with physical precious metals. We believe in ownership. We believe that if you can't hold it, you don't own it. And, you know, Jerry, I was having a discussion yesterday, and it's, it's kind of a formula um, that I've been working with over the last little while, speaking of inflation, about just understanding how to be successful with registered accounts. Now, I'm not an advisor, uh, you know, uh, we're not advisors. If you're looking to, to get involved in this market, please speak to those you trust. With that said, uh, obviously we do a lot of ob observing with all of our clients and it's come, I've just come to realize that the whole game of the RSPs is you defer your income, great. Now what do you have to do? Well, you've put in a loaf of bread and in 20, 30 years, you, you want to be able to take out that loaf. So what do you have to accomplish? Remember, you've deferred the income to save so you're not giving it to the government because it's your money. But you want to make sure that when it's time to take it out, you're getting all of it back. Not, not, not less a slice, mm -hmm. not less half the loaf, the entire loaf of what you've earned. And so the first thing is, is you have to actually beat real world inflation. Mm -hmm. Now that's hard to tell because the government says it's 2% or less. And then you go to the grocery store and fill up your gas tank or pay your electric electric bill or insurance bill or your health club or, right. your, or your kids you school, it. whatever it is, um, you know, having to dress them up for dance class or whatever you realize, oh my, oh my gosh, this is way more expensive than the first kid. Mm -hmm. um, and you just realize, okay, well, maybe inflation's higher than that. Okay. So call it five, six, seven percent, whatever it is now. So that means at let's say 5% a year, that's 50% every 10 years and a hundred percent every 20 years. Well, to double your money in an account over a 20-year period does not sound like the hardest hurdle to get over. <laughs> now there's getting out of the RSP and the taxes, impl the tax implications when you pull it out. Let's call it another 30. Call it another 50. So that means over a 20-year period, you need to make 150%. Mm -hmm. If you can make that 150%, you've done it. You've won the game. You've retained your purchasing power on what you've invested, right? And you've got back the full loaf. Now that's on a 20 year period, right? Based at 5% mm -hmm. inflation, <laughs> okay? If it's a little higher, okay, we increase it. Mm -hmm. Gold's done 11% a year for the last 20 years on average. That means it's definitely doing that. Mm -hmm. It's giving you all of that. It's giving you that purchasing power, covering taxes, covering inflation, getting back the whole loaf. This is the whole purpose to mm -hmm. me. This is the, my, my yeah. theory that I've been working on just to, to understand what the goals are. Yeah. I think most people go into investments and they don't even know what the goal is. No. What's the goal? Well, I want to, I want to make this. I need to make money, whatever it is. And, you know, the advisor goes from there. Mm -hmm. Well, we did this this year. Okay. But what's the anchor? What's the, what, That's right. what am I actually, what's the goal here? What, how mm -hmm. do I know what I'm testing this against? So that's what I'm testing it against. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, are you beating inflation and covering the taxes to pull it out? Exactly. That's my spiel. Exactly. And with the bank, you have to also remember if, if it is a mutual fund that you're going to be in, you have to also beat the MER, the ratio that you have to uh, get over a, a year over year. And plus the average investor, just let's just, you know, call a spade a spade. We don't know what's inside of those mutual funds. At least with gold, you know, you're getting that that performance, the 11, 12% per year minimum. Uh, 
But the, again, the whole point is you want to put your money, your capital into something that you trust, that you know will be there, that cannot go to, that won't go to zero, um, and that is safe. Safety first. You want to protect your wealth, ensuring that you're going to get it back one day. But then positioning to, uh, you know, positioning for that loaf to start growing. Add some more yeast, as I say, to the bread. <laughs> The number one eight seven seven eight silver and the website guildhallwealth.com. I'm going to go get some yeast during the break. <laughs> Stick with us. It's the Real Money Show on Global News Radio six forty Toronto. We're going to get right into this article talking about the real estate market, the bubble in the real estate market. Before we do. I think it's important also uh, just to return to the first thing we were talking about, Jerry, at the at the top of the show. Just looking at the fact that gold's down a little bit. That so far this year, silver's down just a touch at this point. But I just want to reiterate something we talked about last week on the show, which was that back in March this time last year, the price of gold was trading at sixteen seventy five which we're above that right now. And it went down to a low of 1478 within about 10 days. That was a $200 downdraft or a 12% swing. And then it moved up by April 14th. It moved back up to 1736, back up to 258. And uh, from 1736 by August, it was up to over $2,070, which again, that was a 19 and a half percent swing in price on the silver side you saw silver trading at the end of february last year 2020 close to 19 dollars an ounce it pulled down by march 19th so a few weeks later down six dollars and 87 cents that's a 35 dollar 35 percent downdraft in price it moved back up to 1833 by june and then by august literally basically two months later it was up 60 percent. So what's the takeaway? Understand that we are in a new price level in precious metals and there are going to be bigger swings, mm -hmm. double digit swings. It's no longer silver going from 18 to 16 to 19 to 17, you know, switching within a $2 price range, although we have been trading pretty narrowly on silver recently. Mm -hmm. But we these are something this is something we should be expecting going forward. Now, I've always seen and believe that with gold, it's really a two-step forward, one step back. You test the higher level, you pull back a, a little bit, and then you you break it. Silver is a little more volatile, so you don't it doesn't you don't see it or feel it as much. But again, thirty-five percent price swing, sixty percent price swing. Be ready for action, mm -hmm. and it can happen at any time. Exactly. We are ready. As long as you have the physical precious metals, um, you are prepared. And our job here is to set these expectations and to provide education as to how the markets operate. We view these assets as money, as currencies uh, that cannot be printed out of thin air. So when you see the money markets slosh around and when you see the gold and silver prices slosh around, remember that they're algorithm driven. Anytime you see a drop in paper, who's really selling that silver? No one's coming to Guildhall to sell any gold or any silver. I can't, I can't even... Uh, remember the last time someone sold uh, some meaningful product, maybe some you know one ounce bars here or there, but meaningful, sizable sellings. We're not selling it. We're not seeing it. Yeah. So uh, seeing right through this, this is very normal. This is very healthy. Knowing that we are on the cusp, the tail end of that cup and handle, Jeremy. This is the the formation of a fifty year cup and handle. A very bullish signal that yes, these are the new floors for precious metals, and we're heading into a new super cycle in precious metals. Well, let's look at one another fundamental that will also be driving the precious metals, which is. Just looking at the home prices and the and the real estate market right now, as an example, because it's going to segue ba segue back. So there was an article uh, put out just yesterday from the from Better Dwelling, uh, Stephen P uh, Punwazi, and uh, the article's title was "Home Prices Are Rising in a Recession, But Central Banks Because Central Banks Killed Capitalism." So the the essential tenet of this article is that. When there is a low risk environment, borrowers are encouraged with low rates. Mm -hmm. So a, a lender would say, I don't see a risk here, so I'm going to offer you a very low rate. 
because I don't see a risk. So let's say uh, go back 10 years when the average home in Toronto was selling for like half a million, mm-hmm. 600,000, um, you know, they, they would see no risk and they'd give you a great low interest rate. But then something happened. Somehow that low interest rate continued even as the risk threshold continued to rise in the market. There, I don't think you would come across anyone that would argue that there is less risk today in the market than there was six years ago. What do you think? No, not at all. So the idea is that the higher the risk, the higher the cost. So as the risk is increasing in the market, the lender would say, I have to raise the cost on this to cover the risk factor. Well, why did that disappear? Why is there a distortion now? Why is it that we're, we're in, and this goes to the Fed too. This goes to interest rates in the States. How could you keep printing money and the interest rates are low? It doesn't make sense. Are, is, where's the risk, mm-hmm. right? How come, there, how come it feels like there's no risk? Right. So why is it that in a market where there's clearly much more risk, the signal to the market is there's no risk because the interest rates are low? Well, it's pretty easy. Um, what this article points to is that they've suppressed the lower rates, yeah. right? So he looks at central banks. Basically, what he's saying is the central banks looked into the future, saw the potential crisis, headed it off by lowering interest rates. And how do you keep them low? You buy the debt market behind it. Mm-hmm. So they backstop. Mm-hmm. They backstop their, their own market so that they can keep this going, which creates an incredible distortion. The distortion is is that people look around and they say, "Well, rates are low." Mm-hmm. So we can borrow all this much more. Now, in the 70s, we're going to talk about your article in a bit there, Jerry. In, in the 70s, there was, there was price inflation, and you had a property, and it increased due to inflation. And so, as a result, you won. Mm-hmm. Today, people think the same thing. Inflation will... Uh, I, have a, I have property. I'm only paying 2% or less. And inflation, they're basically, with the inflation and my low rate, I'm basically being paid to buy this property because it's going up at 6 7% a year, Yeah. right? So I'm winning unless you realize at some point that you bought something that's overvalued. And if that comes down in price significantly, you're no longer a winner. Mm-hmm. You're no longer beating inflation. You bought an asset that was way too high in price and it just imploded on you. And that goes with any asset that has been a recipient of this monetary policy of keeping interest rates low, stimulating the buyer, and making it very, very cheap for you to own, for you to, uh, for you to borrow. And this is a, this is the problem today. The, The underlying problem is there is too much M2 money supply and too few good products and goods to to put that money into. So we're seeing, uh, as a result, we're seeing, you know, assets that are, you know, benefiting, currently benefiting from this type of monetary policy. Um, We can look around and we see the prices going up in every asset class almost, uh, except precious metals. Again, this is the reason why we like precious metals so much. It's anti-bubble and it's going to do the exact opposite when that time comes for that bubble to get pricked. This exactly. This is what will happen when everything reverses. Precious metals will uh, reverse and uh, go in the opposite direction. And I feel with with regard to precious metals, one of the things I've learned by being in precious metals and seeing the price rise despite manipulations, despite banks trying to keep keep the price low, despite the machinations of the U.S. dollar versus gold or whatnot, is just that it, it ultimately always moves up. Yeah. Um, and so you just kind of you kind of have a comfort in that at the end of the day on what you're seeing there. So this article, getting back to this, um, he talks about the fact that uh, because rates are cheap, there's now a crowded trade because everyone wants to get involved because everyone everyone can get involved because the rates are so cheap. Mm-hmm. So the market is no longer functioning in a free market way where those who can't afford the risk can't get in. Mm-hmm. Right, so people people can afford the risk. The risk is being completely ignored, and you can see the bubble in the market. There's people s- giving letters to the sellers 
you know, here's a picture of my family. Here's a letter. We really want to buy this property. I mean, that's desperation. I, I know that in the States, I think the, the housing at the bubble peak was just over four times earnings me or four times income mm -hmm. right i'm i would i would assume right now in toronto at least that it's higher than that yeah which would be a, an indication of a bubble I'm, I'm i'm if someone has an article that shows us that we'd love to, we'd love to have that so um at the end in this article from stephen Pan panwazi he basically says what we're seeing right now doesn't happen in free market capitalism it happens in communistic regimes this top-down control on the economy and suppression of rates and suppression of risk and i don't think that it was intentional i think it was that i think it was that government and central banks are scared of seeing bad things happen on their watch mm -hmm. and they just don't want to deal with it they want to they want the easiest route and so it's just let's print money let's lower the rates let's keep this distortion going we need the real estate market mm -hmm. we can't afford to have it pop we can't afford to have it go down so what do they do they print money they lower interest rates they stamp out the risk concept and what does it do it fuels the bubble mm -hmm. No wonder so many people do not want to get back into this market right now. They're selling homes. They're saying, what do I do with it? I can't put it in the bank. I don't trust the banks. Mm -hmm. And I'm not getting any interest in the banks. So what gives? I can't go back into the real estate market. I feel the risk. I understand the risk intuitively without without intellectualizing it the way this article does. Mm -hmm. And so they're looking at alternatives. Can't go into, can't go into the stocks if that's how you feel, because you'd look at the stocks and say it's 200% of GDP, yeah. right? That mo how many of them are, are zombie companies with massive amounts of debt that what happens when the interest rate goes, goes up? See, the, this is another part that mm -hmm. actually was mentioned in the article, this idea that money printing and debt and creation of debt depends on low interest rates. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens if that changes? It's pretty oh, scary. That's right. Pretty scary to think about what happens as soon as you know. Well, you well, can't do it in perpetuity. Eventually, you've got to pay for all this money, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why they call it a taper tantrum. You know, when you start uh, jawboning and talking about it, you're going to see the fluctuations and, and the volatility that we're seeing right now in, in today's markets. Um, not to mention the amount of money printing happening. They just passed the 1.9 trillion dollar stimulus bill in the U.S. <laughs> And we, we go through that figure and we're realizing, wait a minute, where is the people's money? Where is this where is this money really going? So the blinders have been put on to everyone. They're suppressing all of the information from us, but we're seeing right through it. Investors are coming into precious metals hand over fist, and we're very excited to help people get into the market. It the, that stimulus was was an abomination. I yeah. mean at one point nine trillion, I think they only handed out a hundred billion to actual people in in terms of checks that's right so it's equivalent to me saying hey jerry give me a hundred dollars and i'll give you back ten sound good sounds great does it doesn't that sound wonderful <laughs> wouldn't you take that on no but jerry here's the thing i'm going to give you ten dollars right now you don't actually have to give me a hundred i'm just going to take a hundred from you over the next ten years how does that sound it still doesn't sound good to me. So you want to get out of that. You don't want a part of that. The best thing about precious metals is there's zero counterparty risk. When you actually own physical precious metals that you can touch and feel, it means that no one can take that away from you. No one can print that into oblivion. Thousands of years shows us by history that gold and silver are safe havens. They've never gone to zero. And in this type of atmosphere, hey, who knows? Maybe one day your favorite vacation home will be uh, very affordable because of silver. We've been talking about all things gold and silver, but we've been also talking about the real estate market and inflation and governments and central banks printing a whole smack load of money that eventually we all have to pay for. And we're going to pay for it pretty hard with inflation. So how do we protect against that? Of course, have some gold and silver in your portfolio, and that's our opinion. And with Guildhall, you can own it directly. You can buy it direct, take it home, go to guildhallpreciousmetals.com, pick out your favorite coin, bar, um, and you can have it shipped to your door. Payments are pretty are very easy. Or you can give us a call, one eight seven seven eight silver We can help you directly. And of course, you can hold physical precious metals in a registered account. What that means is your product is held 
segregated, allocated. It's your own sub account at the vault, independent vault outside the banking system, but it's still IROC approved and in your registered account. We even have people who have rifts and lifts where they have to take out their funds on an annual basis. And what they do, Jerry, is they actually take it out in kind. So mm -hmm. they actually remove their physical product and we have it shipped to them directly. Now, I don't know any investment out there where you can say, you know what? I really want my Apple stock. Can you ship that home to me? No. It just doesn't happen. It's either cash, ship me my cash. Equivalent, uh, yeah. Or, or send me this actual asset. So I'm amazed by this every day. I love the fact that when people own this, they really, they really can can see and feel that they have no counterparty risk. Exactly. Sometimes sometimes it's almost too hard to believe because it's so simple mm -hmm. and they wonder, well, where's the contract? Right. Right? And you have to look at all of the other contracts that are out there, whether it's a gold-backed fund, an ETF, a, um, a pool account. All of these things show that ownership is held with the custodian and not with the the investor the owner. and that's what makes it an investment because there's a counterparty that's right and it doesn't matter how much you trust the counterparty right it's still an investment mm -hmm. right it's like when you uh i guess if you if you have to get a marriage contract or whatever right uh, a prenup prenup thank you very much <laughs> I, a complicated word <laughs> um but you know what i'm saying yeah. it's like oh well i i trust this person yeah but you just got a prenup <laughs> <laughs> right no. so okay it's a business deal but that's still an investment that's mm -hmm. still uh it might be a terrible analogy i don't know but you, you can sure. catch the drift yeah i catch the it. idea is that there's a counterparty and you know it and then in this case there is no counterparty because you that's know right. you own this product and no one else can touch it so we've been talking about inflation and one of the best examples of inflation that we've seen happened in the 70s. And you've got an article here talking about exactly that and what happened to the metals as a result. Exactly. Now, we, we talked a little bit about the, the stimulus in the last segment, uh, the $1.9 trillion stimulus that uh, was just passed this week by the, 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 in the U.S. Um, and another $3 trillion into infrastructure is pretty much hot on its heels. So inflation is that elephant in the room. It's... It's coming whether we like it or not, and this is why I love charts and looking back, uh, looking back throughout the decades, even centuries. So, bringing up the report by the in, uh, by in Incrementum, it's called In Gold We Trust. It's a three part, and I love it. It's um, it's one of the arguably the preeminent annual report on gold and silver. It's read by over two million people, and they commented about rising bond yields without any without even seeing any mean, meaningful inflation. I believe the CPI and the inflation data is a farce. I think that they're putting on the blinders over eyes once again. We know the cost of items are going up. Uh, but they talked about, you know, the last bout of serious inflation was in the 70s. Apart from leaving the discipline of the gold standard and other market factors, it saw rampant money supply growth. And they, they included a chart, which is great. Uh, they We see Two programs back in the 70s where they tripled and doubled the money supply, which is called M2, each respective time. That saw inflation, ro which rose from 3% up to 12.5% almost immediately. What happened to interest rates? It went to 20%. And the stock markets collapsed by 50%. Well, I, you know, on that topic, um, you know, because I've read... Uh, I've, I've read Ron Paul's book uh, on that, The Case for Gold, yeah. and he talks about that, the fact that basically once they took off the gold standard as it, as it was at the time, th it let them print all this money. And so for the first time, they had all of this. We know that, of course, Nixon then put in price controls, yeah. which is something that had been done back in the Roman era. We're going to print all this money and to st stop people from realizing all of this printing, we're going to put price caps on everything. So even if you need to raise your prices in order to stay in business and stay profitable, we're going to stop that. We're going to stamp that out. And that led to a lot of the lineups at the pumps, mm -hmm. all of these things. So, and then the difference between in the 70s and today is that Volcker raised interest rates to 20% or 18%, but there was a savings rate. So that's right. It, they, you only had a decade of money printing mm -hmm. behind you. So you still had uh, you still had a, a dearth of money available yeah. and people had savings. And so they could absorb that 
that increase. Um, I'm sure there were people that walked away from their homes at the time. Um, I'm sure there was that there was some fallout from it, some collateral mm-hmm. damage. But as a whole, they could they could do that. Mm-hmm. They're pinned now. They can't do that. And this is just a decade, decade, a little bit over a decade ago. This happened, and we are today in uncharted territory. And further, you know, back to the back to the article, the stock market then in the 70s lost 50 percent of the value. What happened to gold and silver back then? Well, they both skyrocketed Seven, 1,750% for both precious metals. And today, we extrapolate to 2020, the money supply is five times that of the 70s. Five times, Jeremy. And where is the inflation today? So the inflation is not following the M2 money supply. Why not? Don't look at it. We don't want to, we don't want to uncover the risk. The inflation is there. It's brewing. It's about to pop. And this is reason why, like going back to the whole gold standard, you know, our investors know that that the biz, that the Bank of International Settlements, they're hinting at some sort of a reset with the with the gold, with the gold. Um, it could be a partial, and this is what this this report talks about. There could be a partial, you know, bringing back the gold standard to to bring back the system to normalize or you know bring health back and stability back to the system. You need some sort of a standard. Okay, so. When we come back, I just want to get back to what you just said. You said that the precious metals went up thousands per, thousands of percent in the 70s. And the amount of money printing that's happening right now is five times that of what was happening in the 70s. Where could that lead precious metals prices today? The number one eight seven seven eight silver. The website guildhallwealth.com. If you're just joining us, Jerry, you've been talking about this article uh, in Gold We Trust article from Incrementum, read by millions of people. And one of the things that you were noting from the article is that the amount of money printing that happened at the outset of lifting the gold standard today, it was it was a lot back then in the seventies. Yeah. Today, it's five times as much. Yep. Yeah. And in, at the end of the 70s, we saw gold and silver respond to that inflationary event by moving up over a thousand percent each. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly what happened. And the key takeaway of this for our listeners is just know that the but the more you print, inflation follows that. Well, we're printing more than ever before, but inflation is not following that. What has to happen? It has to correct, and inflation will follow eventually. And there's and there's two things that can happen. They can they can just say, we're going to keep printing, and just go full out hyperinflation. We're just not going to stop. We're not going to take our foot off the throttle until this goes off the cliff, Thelma and Louise style. Or we start to taper, and we have austerity, and we get massive deflation. Maybe there's maybe there's a compromise there somewhere in between where they say, you know, your you pension funds aren't getting your money. You people who have to buy in have to put in more. Wow. Um, we're going to default on this. We're going to keep printing money, but you're not getting any of it over here. Just like Bear Stearns kind of thing. Yeah. Right. We're going to print money, but we're going to pick and choose who gets it. Like so some stimulus, people are going to yeah. fall. Some people are not. It's going to be potentially crazy mixed signals. But you have to understand the fundamentals that you can't print money without any value. That's the problem with Bitcoin too right now because what's the value of it? Mm-hmm, it doesn't bad. have any intrinsic value. You can't buy anything with it. We've had clients try. Mm-hmm. you know. And not only that, what I've noticed with that is the exchanges are, are, are raising, the, raising the cost all the time on you. Yeah. you know, I had a client who just converted out of, his, out of his crypto. And I think when he bought it originally, it was like 2%. And now it's up to 4% to, to exchange his money, mm-hmm. right? That's because it, there's so much more happening on it, and it's such a slow process anyway. They have to cover because it's also volatile, mm-hmm. so they have to raise the rates on that. Mm-hmm. Very different in precious metals. The reason you have higher premiums is because there's no product available, mm-hmm. not because there's lots of product available, yeah. not because you can buy an increment of a half an ounce of silver right. or, a, or or .0085 of silver, mm-hmm. right? I know I'm ranting a little bit, but the point no. is, is that in, in silver, it's, it's very clear that there's a lack of physical product. We can only bring so much in 
through the ref- mm-hmm. through the refining capacity, sourcing, refining, wholesaling, retailing. Yeah. Right. There's only so much that runs through that system at one time. So you know you're going to s- either need to see sustained lower prices for a long time here before premiums start to come down, or or prices have to rise to reconcile the fact that there's a massive demand, low supply, and the paper price is BS. Yeah. That's exactly what's what we're looking at right now, and that's not going to change. I mean, the the report also talks about in institutional investors. Right now, it's just the you know the average investor coming to the market. But what happens if the pensions start coming into the market into gold? Um, the report talks about a five percent allocation in in all of these other other markets, whether it be oh mutual gosh. funds, pensions. Uh, they talk about the largest and ten largest investment banks. It would squeeze the gold and silver market to a point where it will increase the demand by gold investment by eight thousand percent again just a five percent allocation in gold or two percent allocation in gold by all of these majors the premiums are coming down that's the whole point but we are in uncharted territory uh, for many things like this monetary policy even Bitcoin it's relatively new it's still trying to find its its place its real value um, so you know we, we do see that there is um, you know, benefit to the blockchain, but we just don't know which one, which coin will it be? Yeah, so it's still risk on with that, whereas precious metals is a defensive. So that, that's why there's room for both in a portfolio. Oh, yeah. What I think is interesting about institutions, though, I think, I hope that the Reddit, Wall Street bets, this new hot spotlight on, on the gold and silver market and learning about that market, I do hope that those institutions decide not to go with the ETF and to go with an actual allocated product because the ETF, if they go with that, they're hurting themselves because the ETFs can take that fake product that they never acquired and since they have it fake, they didn't actually go out and get it, mm-hmm. they're now going to short the market and the market's not going to go anywhere. Yeah, central banks don't... Central banks give us the biggest message. They never bought ETFs for their reserves. Central banks are motivated, especially since the great financial crisis of 2008-9, they were motivated to shore up reserves with an asset without counterparty risk. Not digital. It's got to be held entirely outside of the banking system. That's what we do here at Guildhall. But even more, they're anticipating something. They don't want to go through another great financial crisis. And there is a school of thought and a system going back to this whole great financial reset. What does that look like? There's a common school of thought that report talks about, whereas a system where the M2 money supply, which is in the trillions, probably the quadrillions, perhaps, if we're going to you know, throw in derivatives in this market, but that you're going to have to back up that M2 money supply with just a 40% value in gold. So not a full-on you know, gold standard where 100% it's not practical, as the old Britain Wood system had it. A 40% value with gold. What would that put gold? Okay, hold on, hold on. We need the we need the sound effect, the alert. We've got a yeah, we've got is, a quote alert going on. This is where, where do they say the price of gold is is going? Yeah, this is the cowbell moment. This yeah, is where cowbell we, moment. Where does that leave gold with a forty percent allocation to back up that M two money supply? It yeah. puts gold at twenty four thousand dollars right now, which would at just a thirty you know bring the silver to gold ratio to thirty to one. Where okay. it should be historically going back ages. Well, it should be sixteen to one, but we'll say thirty. That's fine. Thirty eight hundred dollars silver, eight hundred dollar per ounce silver. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna take your eight hundred an ounce silver. And okay, I'm gonna raise you, Jeff Clark from from GoldSilver dot com. Um, he writes really good articles, by the way. He's a he's a good one to follow. We Phenomenal. talk about him a lot on the show. Uh, Mike Maloney had a good hire with that. Um, he talks about. We talk about the gold-silver ratio. Well, what about the gold-real estate ratio? I talk about it with clients all the time, just as another another indicator to look at, to understand what the value of gold is, what the value of silver is. So he's actually put it together. And he said that uh, in the article, I'm just going to give a couple quick quotes here. Um, You can see that gold's peak in 2011, it took only 135 ounces to buy the average price home in the U.S., in 1980, speaking of inflation, Jerry, good job bringing that article, um, 85 ounces, 85 ounces. Now, everyone listening to the show, I want you, when you get home, when you stop driving or whatever you're doing, pick up a pen, grab a calculator, go look up a home. The, it's a million dollars right now to buy a home in Toronto. I want you to divide that by Canadian price of what, let's say 23 2300 an ounce 2400 yep. an ounce so take a million dollars divide by 2400 and see what it costs right now to buy a home it's not $85 an ounce and i can tell you it's certainly not $135 an ounce now he goes on to say that um, it takes right now the average home 
in the U.S. 50, over 15,000 ounces of silver. <laughs> I think if you do the math on a home in Toronto and in a good neighborhood, you're probably looking at probably a virtual ton, which is over 32,000 ounces. And uh, in 2011, it took 5,500. 5,500. In 1980, wow. less than 1,500. So the takeaway here is if you can get yourself 1,500 ounces of silver into the market today, you just might be able to afford a cottage outright with that silver. And at $800 an ounce, yeah, that's about right. That's about a million dollars for a cottage, right? Yep. And precious metals will do that. And I always talk about get yourself 2,000 ounces of silver. It's a measly $70,000 today. You can buy yourself an average home wherever you'd like. You're making the rules with your precious metals. I love that analogy because it's all about hard asset for hard asset for me. That's the that's the play. It's either you're rolling that silver back into gold and running up the ratio once again, or you're rolling out of silver. You're getting yourself a cheap property or a, or a property with with, uh, with your asset that has tons of purchasing power. And if seventy thousand does not seem measly to you, you can start stacking and pick up some silver at you know it's like four hundred and fifty dollars for a ten ounce bar, or just over four hundred dollars for a ten ounce bar and you can start stacking today and work your way up to that and we're ready to help the number one eight seven seven eight silver the website guildhallwealth.com well guess what that went by fast too fast that was crazy it was a lot of fun talking with you today about this market and thank you for all of the listeners joining us this week we can't wait to speak to you next week here on the real money show on global news radio 640 toronto